Welcome, everybody. We're just getting started here. I sent Laura the wrong link. We'll give her just a minute to get uh, acclimated to the room. And you do have access to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to know who you are and where you're coming from. And yeah, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn okay. it over to Dr. Tuman. Welcome, everybody. It is great to be here today. Uh, if you saw the commentary on LinkedIn, I'm just talking about some of the ethical issues and some of the AI and writing discussions, because there's so much that we could be talking about. Uh, and I'm sure that you all don't want to be here all day. If you are interested in looking at my website, the QR code is here, the um, URL is there as well. And the part that might be of most interest to people is the Creative Commons files where I have put some of my assignment sheets. You are welcome to take a look at those and see what I'm doing in my classes. And I also am happy to answer questions about those if you look at them and then realize that you want to ask questions about what's going on. All right, so the focus of my talk today not catching cheaters and not using AI detection tools is a big one for me. And I'm still maintaining academic integrity. I just don't believe that using AI detection tools is a valid way forward. And so I do not talk about that. I believe in, yes, asking people to be their authentic selves, asking our students to be their authentic selves, ourselves allowing other people to be their authentic selves as well, and how we can use AI and still support that. And then my big thing is always talking about ethical, responsible, and transparent use of AI. And I know that some people have thoughts about that as well. I'm not going to get too much into that, but there's a lot of conversation around that discussion as well. I wanted to start with my English composition classroom and how I do some things there. I am very big into privileging students' authentic voices, which is something that I think shifted maybe about a decade ago in composition studies to really look and say that there are different dialects, different Englishes that students might use in our classroom, and all of those have validity. We're not trying to force or push anyone into that standard English and only accept that standard English. Good advice, but sometimes it can be hard to follow. And that's part of where we get into some of these AI discussions. I started out as a tech writing instructor completely. I'm a tech writing major. And I only got into teaching composition later on in my PhD. And now I teach it every semester. And I like teaching it every semester because it keeps me in touch with what's happening as English is changing. And that's a lot of fun for me. But looking at the differences in what I'm asking my tech writing students to do, they need to be very clear, very precise in their writing. And so language really matters. In composition courses, we can have a little bit more play with having people's voices really shine through. We need to learn to love our own voices, which is not always easy, especially if we are constantly being told that our own voices aren't good enough. We also need to know where our home dialects might hurt us, which is something I've had some experience with. I'm really good at Valley Girl. I was raised in the 1980s, and so Valley Girl is strong with me. Dropping my G's is strong with me as well. If I'm talking in my home dialect, I am from southwestern Virginia, and I took on much of the dialect of the people around me. Unfortunately, when you talk like that, people tend to make assumptions about your uh, value or your intelligence levels, and that becomes a real problem. Thankfully, at this point, AI is not directing me to drop my Gs, so that's good. I'm really concerned a little bit, and this is especially in my comp classes, this is not so much in tech writing, but that less grammatical correctness and more relationship building. So people are constantly asking me how I'm sure that my students aren't cheating with AI, and it's that relationship building that really comes in and helps me feel comfortable believing that my students are doing what I'm asking them to do. Students, when we have relationships with them and we show them that they have value and their voices have value, they gain confidence in their own voices and their own dialects. And that helps them to better express their ideas. With these relationships, when we come in and we're like, hey, let's try out this new AI tool, we can do that. We can critically engage with the tools and our students are more willing to go on that journey with us. Instead of thinking that something's being imposed on them, or if we're banning it and we're saying, I don't care why you're trying to use it, it doesn't matter to me, there's no good reason, 
then unfortunately that can push students into doing things that maybe they wouldn't otherwise do. If they feel comfortable with us, they can say to us, I tried this thing and it worked great. Or I tried this thing and it failed miserably. In fact, we were talking today about the young man who um, unfortunately committed suicide after working with Character AI and how his mother is suing. And we had a really good conversation about that and why those kinds of things are concerning for us. We can help students to gain confidence in their use of AI-generated text alongside their own text. So instead of this idea of, I'm just going to have AI write my paper for me because I don't care about this class, we can't fix the I don't care about this class part, but we can try and make the content engaging so that students can play with these texts and they can go, okay, that information helps me to find a different way to talk about it. I don't want to use those words, though, because those words don't sound like me and I want to sound like me. And that's what I'm finding with most of my students right now. Okay, this one's funny, and I just I have an arrow that we're going to get to here in just a second. So when trying out AI tools in class, I like to show students different tools and let them see what the tools can or can't do. I use Claude a lot because that one is my favorite one for writing help. I don't tend to use ChatGPT very much, but I'll show them Claude. I'll show them Perplexity. I show them tools like Undermined, um, Mind, not Mining. And we look at those things and see what they can do or connected papers and show how the cool webs get built. I like to have students reflect on their work at UCO, University of Central Oklahoma, where I am. We're really big on transformative learning and reflection pieces are a part of transformative learning. So that was already built into my curriculum. And I just added a couple of questions about what AI did you use? Where did you use it? Did you find it helpful? What did it make your life harder? And those reflections help students to really see if using AI makes sense for them in that moment. All right. And then this last one here, we need to avoid shaming students who might need a little bit of help. This is an accessibility thing where students who are first gen or non-native speakers, neurodiverse students may need a little bit more help. We may have students who have high anxiety at that blinking cursor or who just may really struggle to come up with topics. And the AI can be really helpful to people in those spaces. But when we shame people for needing extra help, we may end up causing harm and we don't want to cause harm to our students. All right, now to that arrow. AI misunderstood the assignment. So when I use PowerPoint, I use the designer and I have it build my prettiness on my slides, all the pictures and whatnot. And for some reason, it decided that when we talk about avoiding shaming students, we need to sync. And so I just wanted to point out some of the places where AI goes off the rails or maybe misunderstands the assignment. I think that's important when we're talking about AI tools. This was an IRB project that I did in the spring, and I'm actually running it again this semester, and I will be talking more in detail about it in the spring at the Southwest Texas Pop Culture and American Culture Conference in February. So with this particular assignment, it's these are all first semester writing students that I'm working with, and I have them try out the four major large language models, Claude, Copilot, Gemini, and ChatGPT. And they're assigned in groups of three or four to work with their large language model. But they're asking it questions and then they're critiquing the large language models output. So they're not, their research question is like the chip to get to the dip. It's not the main focus. So they're looking, they're doing a rhetorical analysis on the output from the large language models. And they're looking at ethos, pathos, and logos. They're looking at repetitive words, signal phrases, that kind of thing that might indicate that this is AI and not their own. And then they're comparing that to their own writing and their own voice. And then they're reflecting. So I'm really excited. We are right in the middle of that project right now. And it's been very cool to see some of the new words and phrases that students are noticing. Or that if output is coming out in bullets instead of paragraphs, do you have to really tell it to come out in paragraphs and what that does to how we interpret information. My students back then and now again see their own writing as better than what's coming out of the AI. They see their voices better. They see their ideas as more interesting. That doesn't mean that they're not finding value in using the AI in specific places, but they don't want to have these large language models write their papers for them because they don't see that as being a good use of their time and a good use of AI. They've also said they have to spend so much time editing the AI output that they don't feel like that's worth it to them. And I have to say that brings a smile to my composition teacher face because I like seeing where my students are really starting to engage with this and go, does this make sense for me? 
Okay, so switching over to professional writings and publications, which many of us do have to do, and thinking about voice, does any of this transfer to our own writing? I say maybe, because the rules that we have in place for students with ethical use and voice use may or may not translate well into what we're trying to do. My own response is thinking about this, and this is, this is some personal stuff, but I don't mind talking about this publicly. I am neurodiverse. And what that means for me is that my voice often has not been welcomed in professional spaces because I don't use words in the right way. I don't say things in a way that sounds like I should be in those spaces. Or I question things in a way that, that nobody else in the room is questioning them and people push me off and they go, we're not talking about that right now. And that can be really hard. And I know a lot of academics struggle with different forms of neurodiversity and may need a little bit of extra help. So sometimes my voice is seen as less valuable because of that or less credible. I love my voice, though. I write the way that I talk and I teach. And my goal is to be as accessible as possible for as many people as possible, because I'm trying to bring more people into the conversation. I'm not trying to use words that are going to push people out or confuse them. So for a long time, I didn't write much for public consumption because of that voice concern. And this is where AI maybe comes to the rescue. So I can use AI to make my words sound more professional. I can go from being like, what's up, yo? And I can say, okay, well, should we say that in a way that is more professional as I walk into um, a business meeting? And AI can help me figure that out. Could help my words to be more acceptable. And I don't mean acceptable from a politically correct standpoint. I want to clarify that. I do mean acceptable from the standpoint of people looking at what you're saying and comprehending and saying, okay, I accept this person in my space because they're using the language that I feel like they should be using. I don't often use AI that way, though. And that is a privilege. And I want to acknowledge that publicly, that how we use AI when we use AI may be an indicator of privilege and class ability. And I think maybe we don't talk about that enough when we talk about voice and we talk about the ethics. Others may not always have that ability to be themselves, especially if we are thinking about students or we are thinking about early career academics who are just trying to publish so that they can get tenure and they can keep their job. They may have to shift how they're doing things and they may have to decide what feels ethical to them in the use of AI to broadcast their ideas. So then I have some ideas that I wanted to share with you all about using AI in writing spaces. Okay, one of the things that I really like to use AI for is in that early writing stage. I use Claude to help me put outlines together so that my neurodiverse brain can look at this outline and go, oh, this is how neurotypical people might want to read this information. These are the things that they might feel are important or the order that they might find this information most useful to them in. And once I have that outline, maybe eight, 10 bullet points, I can write a 10 to 15 page paper off of that. I don't need the AI for the rest of it. I just needed it to know what are people anticipating out of this topic? Because sometimes I do struggle and I know our students struggle to ideate really clearly and cleanly and they're sitting there and you read these introduction paragraphs that end up having nothing to do with the rest of the paper. And the conclusion doesn't match. And you can see where students are struggling and we're struggling too. And so that roadmap is the start. But most of the writing is mine. I'm the one who's then coming up with the words and going out and doing the research. So it's not that the AI is doing the work for me. The AI is just helping me to focus. So like laser focus. I've got blinders on now and I can't see anything else out there. I'm just focused here. Again, using tools. But then you read the sources for yourself. You don't assume that any of these sources are right. And one of the conversations we were having in the Facebook group that I run was about the bias that is in these research tools. And I will admit that I hadn't thought a whole lot about that until yesterday. So I was really happy to have that conversation and to realize that when you go out to something like Semantic Scholar, it is... It has made a decision. People who run it have made a decision about what papers are going to be in it and what are not. And so we don't have every single voice out there. We're not able to get behind every single paywall. There are ideas, concepts, and voices that are not being represented by these tools. So they can be used as a starting place, but not an only place. I like to use these along with Google and my 
research database through my library to find different things. So you can also think about having a large language model summarize papers to decide if you actually want to read them. And I talk to graduate students about this because as they're doing research, they're going through 50, 100 different papers to try and find one sentence that they want to use. And sometimes the abstract sounds really promising and then the paper itself is not. So having a large language model do that summary for you and then you can say, oh, this summary sounds interesting or this summary has nothing to do with what I thought we were talking about. That can help you just decide where you're going. And I did talk about the, the privilege and the voicing. If you're comfortable with this, you can take your rough draft and put it into a large language model and ask it peer review questions. And I give some examples here. And these are things that are really helpful for students as well, especially if we're talking about first year composition students who are coming from often a five paragraph essay background, and they're not used to thinking outside of what they can very quickly find. <clears throat> what main points am I missing? You can ask about your audience and say, knowing that my audience is this, how can I make a strong argument or how can I show them that I understand where they're coming from? Are there places that my message just isn't going to resonate? Can I fix that? And that's a really great way to use these large language models. And I'm coming back to privilege here for a second to think about students who don't have access to writing centers or us as faculty who may not have access to writing centers. We may not have anybody else who wants to sit down and read our 18 page article. We can ask these large language models for help. I don't feel like that's unethical because we would do the same thing if we went to a tutor or if we paid a um, an editor to work with our work. So these are ways where we're asking for help. We are not asking to have our own work replaced. And then you edit. So use the comments, use that output from the large language model to do your edits and revisions. And again, it's like peer review as long as you're asking the right questions. When we're working with large language models, it's important not to think of these as one-shot questions. We don't just ask one question and take the answer and walk away. We can dig deeper into what the output is saying to us, or we can say, okay, you told me to do this, I don't understand, and take it further. So continuing to work like you would with a tutor or somebody who's there to help you make your writing stronger. <clears throat> and I'm really big, again, in using your own words to make the points and the writing your own. I have my students highlight any AI-generated text in red. And there are a lot of reasons that I do that. I wanna be able to see where the AI has done a lot of the talking, where they confuse, was it late at night and they were just trying to get something on the paper? And usually in those rough drafts, what I'll find is that when we talk about it and I say, can you tell that the voice shifted here? They're like, yeah. And then so for their final draft, they'll usually go back and put things into their own words rather than leave the AI generated text in there. Where it makes sense to do where we are being asked to do is acknowledge the use of AI. I do this with my students too. If I'm building anything, if I'm showing them some of my writing, I say, hey, this is where I used Claude. This is how I use perplexity. Let's look at building a tree frog life cycle assignment for fifth graders and we'll play around with these things. So I'm very big on being transparent with my students because, again, I don't want us to get into that shame cycle. And I don't want other academics to feel like if they need a little bit of help, that they can't use it. So I think the more that we are all acknowledging our use, in appropriate ways, then the less shameful, the less taboo it becomes and the more we can just talk about whether it actually served our purposes or not. With the personalization of AI tools, I decided not to talk about the new Claude updates because I don't have access to them yet, but I know some people do when we're thinking about what these AI tools can and can't do for us. I'm all for AI use where it makes sense in our own workflow with proper notation and comments about it. Again, I watched some of my friends on LinkedIn and they're doing some really amazing, shiny, sparkly things with AI tools. And I'm like, that is awesome. There is no space for that in what I'm doing right now. So I think that's part of avoiding the hype cycle too, is we see all of these things and we go, oh my gosh, Notebook LM can make a podcast for me. And then I'm sitting here going, I don't like to listen to extra podcasts. So maybe that's not a viable use for me. And I showed my students and my students were like, oh, hey, that's cool. That might help me if I'm struggling with an econ lesson or I don't understand my math or my biology. But I don't know that I would want to just sit around and listen to podcasts of my teachers lecturing. They didn't think that sounded like a lot of fun. It makes sense in some places and not others. We have to each decide where it makes sense to us. And when we get into this workflow discussion and we get into where it makes sense, I want to point out there are also ethical concerns about how the programs are created. There are environmental concerns about 
resources that are being used. And that may factor in. So for me, I also don't go out and just play around with AI tools because I don't want to be overusing water and electricity that isn't necessary. That plays into how I use or don't use AI. For other people, that's not so much of a concern. But that personalization of how we're using the tools really matters. Walking away from the hype, seriously, there is so much hype. It was Leon Furtz earlier this week said, if he never hears again, what was it? This is the biggest thing, or this is amazing, or massive new whatever. And he's got a point because every week there's a new update. And this is going to change the internet. This is going to change our workflow. And you can get really overwhelmed by all of that. And I think sometimes people do. As we ignore that and tune it out, I think that's really helpful for us. When we're using AI-generated text and we want to maintain our voice, we want to encourage our students to do the same thing. I'm actually going to say, consider not using AI to revise or edit. If you follow me on LinkedIn, there are certain tools I'm not a big fan of. And I will also say that it feels a lot lately like Word has been overly drunk in its responses to the editor. It's, it doesn't know verb tenses anymore. It doesn't know possessives. It doesn't know plurals. And I'm sitting here going, man, if I didn't know what I was doing, this would be really hard. So there are places where it might not make sense to use those AI tools because they're, they often condense things down and they say, you can't say this is very big. We want you to say this is large or this is gigantic, but very big makes sense too. There's no reason not to use it. Like I said, word editor, it hates my choices. My choices aren't wrong, but they are different than like the three or four solutions that word has decided are acceptable. And I think it's important for us to think about what happens when students and early career faculty get that bad advice from the AI, and then they start to think that their own writing is bad. I had a certain editing program that took over my computer, and I had it on my computer for about 30 minutes before I took it off because it said everything I was writing in my emails was wrong. Everything I was writing in my text was wrong. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's just different. Don't let people around you be intimidated necessarily by the bad AI advice. As far as our word choices go, again, encourage our students, our peers, ourselves to love our own unique ways of expression. Maintain those grammar rules, though, to an extent. Like, a lot of grammar rules are fake. People get mad about stuff and they're like, I'm going to impose this grammar rule on you. And I'm teaching editing right now, so we're getting back into all of the fake grammar rules, which is a lot of fun. But there are certain standards that you need to maintain. There needs to be punctuation that makes sense, capitalization that makes sense. Our subject verb object needs to be where it's supposed to be in English sentence construction. So we can be open to some variations in how students are using their language as long as they are making sentences and ideas that make sense. And then in all of this, teaching ourselves and our students about audience. What does the audience need? What do they want? If I'm talking to my parents, I'm not going to go, yo, give me the car keys. At least not if I expect to actually get the car keys for that Friday night. I might say, hey, could I get the car keys and I'll fill up with gas on the way home and I will be home by midnight at the latest, right? You're going to use your rhetorical strategies there. We want to meet those needs of our audience. And again, using AI to help not replace our own writing. Okay, I know that was fast, but we've got a few minutes left for questions. If anybody wants to talk about things or ask questions or anything, feel free to shout it out. There's not many people in here or you can type it to whichever. Oh, yes, this is huge. Thank you for uh, posting that, Alfonso. Uh, I have one question uh, related yes. to AI detection tools. Currently, uh, we have a lot of AI detection tools, um, uh, such as ChatGPT Zero and other. And a lot of our teachers are using it for the detection of our assignment and other work. Uh, how we will be deal uh, with these issues? Because I think so, a lot of tools are not reliable because I, I have seen a lot of posts regarding on LinkedIn that people are sharing, such as that Ethan uh, Malik recently uh, shared a uh, Bloomberg AI detection uh, poster on, uh, on, her, on his own um, LinkedIn profile. So how we will be de deal with this issue? Thank you. Yeah. Like I said, I don't use them at all. I walk in the very first day of class and I say, I'm not using AI detection tools. And at first, my students don't believe me. But if you do have a chance to look at some of the assignment sheets on my website in the Creative Commons files, you can see what I've done where I ask my students again. So they highlight any AI generated text in red. They have an icon that they have to put on their paper that tells me if they used AI or not. And then in their reflection memos at the end, they come in and they talk about how they used it. So they're being transparent in their own use. They're interrogating their own use. 
I also have smaller classes, so I realize that's a privilege. I've got maybe 24 students in a class. One of the other things that I do is I have my students, any sources that they use, they have to turn them into a PDF and then annotate them about what quotes they used, where they found something that took them in another direction. So even if they are using AI to help them write their papers, I know that they're actually going out and engaging with the sources some. And I think what we have to do is we have to reconsider what are our learning outcomes for the course? What do we want our students to walk away with at the end? And instead of AI proofing or banning AI, we have to figure out how can we help students engage with these technologies where it makes sense? And how can we convince them not to use them where it doesn't make sense? Like For example, if brainstorming really matters in a moment, bring it back into the classroom and have students spend five minutes brainstorming on their own, doing small group discussion of their brainstorming and then large classroom discussion of what ideas did we come up with. So then you know that they're not using the AI. But we also know that AI tools are now built into everything. LinkedIn asks me if I want to have AI write my post for me. No, I don't. So I think detection for me is not going to be a viable way forward because of the harms that it does as well. So if we're accusing students of using AI detection where they haven't, we may cause students to feel uncomfortable in our classes to the point where they don't finish our classes and they may get behind on graduation. We've seen people be suspended. Uh, we've seen people suing. So I'm just, I'm very much in the camp of we need to change how we're assessing. And I realized that was a really long answer. Okay, thank you for your inside discussion. Yeah, certainly. Linda, yes, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, do you see that students are more engaged with um, English composition in the classes that you teach if you are actually, if, because they are using AI tools and they see more application of English to the workplace? In other words, they see that if they want jobs, I'm, I don't know if you're teaching English composition of a major, but if they are pursuing those kinds of humanity, liberal arts degrees, that they're seeing that the learning of these tools is going to give them a leg up in the workforce. Yeah. In the spring, I'm teaching a technical writing class and we're going to focus very heavily on AI tool use and ADA compliance and kind of push those two together because all of the places that are getting state and federal fund or federal funding have to be ADA compliant by March or May of 26. So we're going to talk about those tools. And I do find that students are more engaged when they don't think that I'm policing them. And when they do think that I'm actually interested in their best interest and in making sure that they are both good citizens and understand what might happen to them in the workforce and what they might need to do. Yes, Roz. Hey, so I also teach AI in my classroom at classrooms. And one of the things that I pretty been pretty aggressive about, I don't know, that's not right, the right word, but <laughs> insistent about maybe is that they don't use the AI in their own writing or use it for everything else, but not their own writing. But I noticed you said that you get your students to highlight if they got AI generated text. What kinds of things do you find that they, what kinds of uh, AI generated text do they use? Like in what situations do they usually use it? And I'm interested also in like why they would want AI generated for those situations. Yeah, it tends to be introductions, conclusions, and transition sentences. So the things that our students are most struggling with that's where they have the AI help them. And then they will often go back and tweak the language so it's their own from the rough draft to the final draft. I see that we are up against time. I am okay staying a few extra minutes if people have more questions and if Kimberly has time to stay on. Sure, yeah. That kind of is, has been our norm with these yeah. quick webinars. But I see some people have to go. And of course, we'll be recording this. So if you need to drop off and watch the recording just for this part, you can. Yeah. Are there other questions? If no one else has one, I still have a follow-up with that. Oh, okay. Ross, so, what you got? so how do you, like when you're doing the transition sentences and all those kinds of things, are they picking, doing that in the editing stage? Or are they running it through the AI and taking the AI suggestions or how is that working? I think so. It's with their rough drafts and... So what my guess is that they were just struggling to find a next sentence or struggling, like they might put their whole draft in and say, write me an introduction, or I want to write a paper about this, write an introduction. 
And so it really seems to be the places where we would often see students having high anxiety or struggling over getting started or figuring out what they need to be doing. And this just gets something on the paper that they can then work with in the later revision stages. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mohammed. I think I saw you and then Christina. It would be good uh, if she asked the post. Oh, okay. Then... Sure. Christina, go ahead. I am on your group on Facebook. So I saw <laughs> our conversation and for me, I'm also neurodivergent and I actually use AI to help sound like other people. So I don't have to try to do that in my head because it takes three times as much work for me yeah. to sound like a colleague who just writes it that way because that's how their brain works to start with. But I teach, I teach teachers in an ESL program and I used to teach ESL and I highly encourage using it with ESL students, partly because it can help alter your voice. Sometimes you don't want to be seen as a certain right. type of you know, learner. And this is one of the few things that I feel is it can equalize that access. And I really like what you said about writing centers, because that's what I tell my students. I'm like, if you would talk to somebody, if you would go to a writing center, if you would hire a tutor or capable, all of those things are things that if you're willing to do those, then AI should also be something that you can work into the process. Because it's something that helps replace, I, I can't afford to hire a tutor. My students would say that all the time, but they could help have AI help them in a way that is like a tutor. I guess I, I'm just curious about the not allowing students to use it for editing grammar. Is that just because that's the thing you're trying to get them to focus on? Or because I use um, a lot for that for myself, but also I have my students use it for that because. All right. I've said this publicly, so I don't mind this being on a recording, but I'm going to come out here with some of my own biases. In the editing community, Grammarly is widely hated because of its bad suggestions. It gives horrible suggestions and it leads people down wrong paths all the time. And so from a technical writing standpoint, Grammarly is one of the worst things you can do to your work. And I wasn't referring just to Grammarly. Right. So, so that's one of the things I'm very strong on that. I tell them, I know that is one of the few things I say, please do not use this. As far as editing for grammar, I think it depends on how you use it. If you're saying, can you help me because I'm hearing I'm having trouble with comma splices or I don't know what an incomplete sentence is. Can you help me find those? I don't think that's a problem. And you're right about people not wanting to necessarily sound like their home dialect. If you're trying to get a job, one thing I've seen is that people are saying that cover letters are all coming across saying sounding exactly the same now because people are just having AI write them. But there are times where you might not even get a foot through the door. If you don't have AI, adjust your sounds just a little bit, your voice and your tone. So I, I think it is subject dependent and moment dependent. But if I want students to focus on their voice, then I'm less concerned about their grammar because we're really trying to get their ideas down on paper. I don't know if that helps. It does. It does. And, and this is, I think for me, this is all just, I actually do talks on this as well. And I've done, I'm starting research on this. So it's very much, about there's a balance between losing your voice and knowing when you want to lose your voice and then balancing that with some of those little pesky details like with mom native speakers where there's certain things that just stick like mm -hmm. we never get really good at getting rid of article use is one of them there's tons of article use mistake it's just a standard thing that becomes an issue and i feel like that having an ai that can help you with those specific things and I always tell my students and people I talk to approach it as like the peer review. Like you're asking it to do something specific. You're not just saying, edit my paper. You're saying, right. edit my paper looking for these things, whether it's grammar, whether it's those sudden places or whatever. It's something specific, a task, not just a generic. Where the voice isn't lost too much when you do that sort of thing because it's not asking for a full revision. And I've, I have found that it is my non-native speakers who tend to go toward having the AI do the rewrite for them. And I actually feel like there's something lost there because I lose a little bit of a sense of who the student is. So yes, now it's a grammatically correct paper, but I don't know what mattered to you anymore because they often will edit it very heavily with the, with, and it's usually Grammarly, which is also a thing. But you're right. It can be really helpful. And I'm seeing that too, where we're with journal articles. So we're seeing more journals saying, we don't want you to use AI in any way, shape, or form. But most journals are published in English. 
And if we have non-native speakers who can't afford to hire an editor who speaks English as their native language, we're we're deprivileging people. We're telling people your ideas don't have value to us because you're not speaking them in a standard dialect that we want. And I think that's a real concern too. So I feel like AI can be used for leveling some of the playing fields as far as grammar and dialect goes. And I'm all about accessibility and bringing more people in. Same. <laughs> awesome. And also, Christina, it's nice to know you're in the group. There's lots of, it's gotten very big. We've got almost 8,900 people as of this morning. Oh, okay. So instead of Gormley, what type of tool do you suggest? Because a lot of time on LinkedIn, I'm seeing that uh, a lot of academicians referring to Pepper Paul. But the second question is related to the citation of LLMs. Could we cite any LLM or maybe ChatGPT or other LLM we have? I have recently read two of our articles. They have explained the citation that how we will be cite LLMs, especially ChatGPT, Google Gemini, and Cloud, maybe. So could we cite it in our paper or maybe in our work, research or Yeah. Different people have different feelings on that. I actually don't want my students citing the large language models. I want them identifying where the AI has generated text. And that to me, it's a nuanced difference. So I feel like if we're citing it, we're saying that this information is valid, correct. I've checked it. I know that it's good. I know that it's free from bias. The facts are right. Whereas if they're just identifying that they have had AI generated text, that is not saying that this is an authority on the matter. So yes, APA, MLA, I believe Chicago and AP may all have citations guidelines for using large language models. I'm just not at that point with the way that I'm using it. But some people feel that they do want to cite it. They want their students to cite it. I think it just depends on what you're trying to get at and how you want people to use it. What else? I was, so, I was actually going to say that in, at my college, like when you talk about accessibility at my college, that my students yesterday were complaining quite a bit about how, about the writing center. Cause we have a, like most, I think pretty much all higher ed places, they have a, we have a writing center, but you have to book a month in advance uh, because it's booked up all the time. Mm -hmm. And so they're asking me, is this, is AI an option instead of, the writing center, and I don't like to say it's good instead of, but I, I think some of your comments, like how to use it, I think, oh, yeah, that, that I can't say instead of, but if you can't get in, you yeah. can't get in. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, we just got a writing center in March, and it's an unfunded mandate, if you will, <laughs> or it's an unfunded decision. So we don't have a lot of hours. We only have 30 hours available, and we've got about 12,000 students here. So that's not a great ratio of tutor availability to students who might need it. And you're right. I don't think it's a replacement. I think it's an if, if this works for you. We also have a high population of working students. So maybe they can't get here between 9 and 5. Maybe they're not on campus until 6 p.m. And so if we are trying to, again, level that playing field and make things more accessible, it can be an also, maybe instead of an instead of. Other thoughts? So a lot of, nowadays, a lot of students and teachers are using a generative AI tools, but they do not have any prayer training and support from the university or maybe from the other stakeholder that we have. So how we will be dealing with the ethical implication or maybe what would be the future consequences of it uh, on student as well as on teacher? Because... Oh, uh, in my university, um, my own teacher are using uh, generative AI tools for, for their own tasks. But when it comes to us, they do not allow us uh, that you are not allowed to use these uh, tools in your assignment and presentation and other stuff. So how we will be dealing with this issue? Yeah, that's a good one. I give a lot of talks at other universities, just trying to help faculty get their foot in the door. I, when this all started, I built myself as just the doorway for faculty in. So we talk about some of the ethical issues. I talk about the bias and why AI detection tools are a problem. And I try, I also run some workshops where I just try to get people to play around with assignment sheets and a little bit of AI. Just let's start. I think a lot of the problem is because 
the way that we are seeing large language models now, it's still new. We're just barely two years into this, right? And you're right. A lot of people don't have any training. I didn't know about these tools until I got thrust into this and I made a decision that instead of banning AI tools, I was going to run an IRB study. <laughs> and that's how I ended up where I am. But I think until people are having these conversations and having a chance to voice their fears and their concerns and then talk with others about how are you using it and what have you found to be helpful and what have you found to be concerning, if we're not having those questions, and those talks, nobody's getting trained and people are just saying, this is all bad. My job's going away. Nobody's here for learning anymore. And then there's a lot of fear mongering. So I think professional development opportunities, the more places that we can get faculty in to talk about these things, the more we have the opportunity to show people where it might make sense in some places. And the more we can show them that I'm not having a cheating problem with my students. And I think it's because of how I approach things. I approach them in that open relationship way with transparency. And so it, it is possible. But I think a lot of faculty just, for whatever reason, make the assumption that everybody's going to cheat. And that's not the reality that I'm seeing. So I think the way forward is just more talking, <laughs> more learning. Linda. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mohammed, go ahead. Well, so I'm just going to say I agree with that because I find like I had so many faculty when I started using AI back when it just, was just coming out, I was teaching, showing it to my students because I thought, I want them to see how to use it and not to cheat, <laughs> not just to cheat or yeah. whatever. And I had so many faculty who came and said, oh, my students are using it to cheat. Aren't your students doing it? No, they don't because I show them it's not as good when you get it to do your writing for you. Yeah. It's, you know, and here's some other things that it can do really well. So, yeah, I... That's exactly what happens. If you don't say anything, then yeah, they will use it to cheat. <laughs> That's what I think. And I think as soon as you show them what it can't do well, all of a sudden they go, oh, it's not good at math. I shouldn't use it for my math homework or it's not good at chemistry. Maybe I shouldn't ask it about these particular things or building bridges or rockets. If you all remember when ChatGPT built all of those gorgeous rocket schematics and most of them would blow up. It's good stuff. Linda, did I see you go off of mute? Oh, you're on mute. Still. I think I went off inadvertently, but I oh, think okay. I was going to what I think it was Roz who said that her students take a writing center. And I would have to say, having just recently completed my doctorate, that was one of the main issues with the doctoral students is the writing center just did not have time. And uh -huh. to be quite honest, they didn't necessarily have writing um, coaches there that yeah. could be at the level of a doctoral student. They were more undergraduate. Once their capacity was very limited. So I feel from my experience that had I had these tools when I was going through, it would have been so much less angst for me. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really good point because most of the writing center tutors are either going to be masters or doctoral students, which means that they might not be great at helping other masters or doctoral students simply because they don't have the kind of stuff. And yes, Moxie. So love that plug in there, Kimberly. Yeah, sometimes we just need help. I can say, please talk to me like I'm a seventh grader or please talk to me like I'm a doctoral candidate and the AI can help with that. Christina, I see your hands. We have a writing center at my <laughs> university and you know how you have a thing against Grammarly? I have a thing against our writing center because often they give really terrible feedback to the students or the student says, I went to the writing center, see here. And the writing center signed off on the paper that has so many errors and mistakes that they were better off not going to the writing center because here they're thinking, I got help. It's better. And in fact, it's worse than it was in its previous draft. And some of that is because they're not versed on how to work with language learners. So mm -hmm. they do not know how to help them. And part of it is they have a philosophy of we are not correcting grammar. We are not correcting all of these elements, yes. which, of course, are part of the writing process. And if those things are awry to a certain extent, it loses message, but they don't do that. So it becomes very problematic. And we ha and that's for undergrads. And our writing center is staffed with mostly undergrads who are good at writing. OK, so they don't even necessarily know how to talk about the things that are problematic. So this is why I often tell my students to use the AI instead of the writing center, because I actually trust the AI a little more than I trust the writing center sometimes. You bring up a really good point. I love writing centers. I love tutors, right? 
But if we're not training the tutors how to work with different groups of students, they can do more harm than good. Or if we have tutors who just come in and only correct grammar and spelling and don't understand the larger implications of how do we move ideas around or this doesn't, you know, quote unquote, flow. That's one of the other things I really like about taking an assignment into ChatGPT and say, can you build me an outline off of my draft? Because then students can see, oh, I talked about A here, but then I talked about A again down here. What if I moved all those paragraphs together? And human readers, especially again, tutors, if they haven't been well trained, may not do a good job of helping students with that kind of work. Wendy, I see you've popped up. I know. So I, oh, I'm assistant dean of that academic resource center at our institution, and we have a writing center that's well established. And it is interesting looking at both sides that tutors or we have writing specialists who have their master's or their PhD, not necessarily trained. But also two T's coming in expecting a miracle, half an, a half hour appointment for a 10 page paper. Right. And it's up the tutor to really sense what are we really focusing in here? And we have seen papers come in where a writing specialist has been working with a student again and again on a draft. And then the student comes in with an AI generated draft and they're like, I'm good. So it's, it, it is, it's interesting, like across us on both sides, what yeah. they're seeing and what students are seeing. And I know for us and other writing center directors that I've but our question is like, what, uh, what we offer that AI did not in the writing center. Um, a lot of times it's connection, community conversation, being part of that academic conversation, it, it, we can't do everything that AI does. And oftentimes the time thing too, or availability, and, accessibility. And I think you bring in a good point about bringing the human back into the loop about what it means. So a student can get an AI generated draft, but if the student doesn't realize where the AI went wrong, like with the graphic, I showed you where it was a sink when we're talking about not shaming people. Like, how does that even make sense? The AI did not get it. But if a student doesn't know the topic well enough or doesn't know the information well enough, they may not realize where the AI is wrong. And having a human in the loop, if I've got 48 comp students in a semester, I can't sit down and talk to every single one of them about every single paper. But they can get help from both the human and the AI and the tutoring center. And they can put all of these pieces together instead of not getting any help at all, which sometimes happens too. Yeah. We also hand out tissues and AI can't hand out tissues when students are very sad about something. Awesome. This is such great engagement. We haven't had this kind of engagement in a while. So it's really oh, lovely to see people showing up and you invite that and online and in person, it seems. So I'm really grateful for your openness and willingness to talk about yourself and yeah, approachability. She's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, people who are not in the Facebook group, I did put the link into the chat. You do have to answer the questions or the bot won't let you in, just FYI, which I find amusing. And as much as sometimes people in the group don't want it to be this way, we are not meant to be a complaining community. We are a community of people who are talking about ideas, discussing things. It's not maybe always as heavily academic as people want it to be, but it is meant to be like a, a pedagogy institute on campus where many ideas are welcome, just not AI detectors. Awesome. Thank you, Kimberly, for inviting me. And please, if you are interested, if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with me if you're not. I'm posting a little bit more now, again, as my life is starting to settle back down. And I try to be engaged in conversations there as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. This was really useful. And we will have it up on YouTube, hopefully later today. Okay. Yes. And I will send the slides too. I know some people were interested in the slides. So Kimberly, I'll email those to you. Yeah. Thank you. And then if it's okay, if I, we usually include those in the description and the YouTube link. Okay. Oh, great. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.